I want to kick off this episode by just thanking you. Thank you so much for listening each week. We are now at three and a half years of the Aspire podcast. It's quite amazing to think that I've been producing and editing each week for three and a half years. This is episode 171. I couldn't have done it without you, the listeners, and this is your first time listening or you've been with me from day one. I just thank you so much for tuning in and hopefully you're finding value each week in the episodes with our wonderful guests and this week is no different. We've got Chelsea Nicolino on this week talking about student mastery and how she is using the grid method in her classroom and wow it's just making such an impact in the students lives and I can't wait for us to discuss that. But before we do that, I just wanted to jump on real quick and just tell you how much I appreciate you. Yeah, this podcast has led to many things, including my new book, Aspire to Lead. And it's pretty fun to see those who have gotten a chance to read it. And I just am so appreciative of the support and just what has been posted so far on social media. So again, if you are enjoying the podcast or the book, please just take a moment and post a review somewhere. If it's on a podcast application or on a book website, that would be extremely helpful. Um, it's just a true honor to, to have you support either the podcast or the book. With that, let's turn to the episode as we talk about student self-pace and the grid method. Welcome back, everyone, to Aspire, the Leadership Development Podcast, where we will be discussing the visions, inspirations, and experiences from top educational leaders. My name is Joshua Stamper, and you can connect with me on Twitter or on Instagram at Joshua double underscore Stamper. Chelsea, thank you so much for being on the Aspire podcast. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited. Well, I got a chance to see you in person not too long ago in Ohio. I guess we can, you know, actually say that now before we had to be in secret because we were scoping out the venue for Teach Better 22, and it was a great surprise not only did I get to see you in person, but I also got to see your fantastic classroom. Yeah, I was so excited you guys got to come out to Ohio. I know it was like super secret. I'd only found out like a couple days before that you all were coming in. <laughs> so I was like, good, canceling all my plans. I didn't have any plans anyways, but I was like, cancel all my plans. I'm coming up to the school. So that was so exciting to see all of you in the same spot I can't say I probably teach better 19 was probably the last time I saw majority of the team together in person. So that was, that was such a fun day. It was, it was so much fun. And uh, wow, your school is phenomenal. I don't know. I, I mean, I guess we'll talk about it a little bit, you know, in this interview, but can you just speak a little bit about just what that space is and, you know, kind of what the school is about? Because I was absolutely blown away by not only your classroom, but just the space in general. And, I can't imagine what it would be like to work there. It's got to be phenomenal. Oh, absolutely. I could talk about this all day. Um, (laughs) I still pinch myself seven years in that I get to work in that building. It used to be the National Inventors Hall of Fame Mm. for when I was like five, when it was like built. We called it Inventure Place. It was my favorite place as a kid. And now I tell my students all the time, I get to work here, which Mm -hmm. like, I, I still can't believe. Eventually, it wasn't a museum anymore. Um, The national headquarters, I believe, is in Washington, D.C. We still have a pocket there, as we call the museum space. So they still run camps out of that room and everything. Um, And we still partner with um, the Inventors Hall of Fame. But we are a five, fifth grade through eighth grade um, STEM school that works primarily there with the Akron Public Schools um, population. So we are an Akron Public School, and we actually have a lottery system and we actually take a certain amount of kids from each cluster or high school cluster in the district. So we are, I would say a great representation of the population of Akron. Mm -hmm. When I did my grad school research, I was like, wow, we like really do mirror the city, which is really cool. So you have students from all different neighborhoods. Um, We have some students out of side of the Akron uh, school limits, but it's pretty amazing. And we, you know, focus a lot on problem-based learning and kind of more like a lot of exploratory inquiry-based learning. And and I get to teach science. So I am the S in STEM. So that's pretty fun. <laughs> that's fun. So Chelsea, I kind of jumped the gun because typically I ask about everyone's leadership journey or educational journey. And, and I went right into your school and, and I know you explained a little bit about what you teach and what you do in, in that space. But 
I would love to still hear about kind of your background and, and how you got into education and kind of your educational pathway. Well, that's the funny story. I At first, when I went to college, I didn't start out in education. I actually was a meteorology major. Oh, nice. For, yes, for a while. And um, my husband... My, he was the, my then boyfriend, now husband, he was in uh, the education um, sphere. And so he kind of was like, Hey, well, how do we, he, you'd be a really good teacher. Just take an, you know, intro to education class, see how you like it. And I loved it. I loved being in the school. So I changed my major. I was really excited about it. And I went to the university of Akron. And then after I graduated, I subbed a little bit. It was really hard to get a teaching job in Ohio at that time. So I was like, all right, I'll put in my time. We, I subbed. That was a great experience. I love subbing. I was fortunate enough to get a long-term sub position for a teacher who went on maternity leave. That was an amazing experience. I mean, I remember the first day I walked in, I kind of looked around the room and I was like, I'm the adult in the room. <laughs> that was still kind of like, it, it just hit me then. And then I was fortunate enough to get the position where I'm at now and been there for seven years. And then two years ago, I thought about it and I was like, I probably should get my uh, master's degree. And I kept, you know, him and in hall and I really didn't know what I wanted to do. I, I love teaching. I still love teaching. And I just couldn't think in the future, but I'm like, I know I probably should get my master's now because my kids are little, <laughs> um, it was only going to get harder from there. So I ended up deciding on doing my educational leadership degree. So I graduated with that in May. So that was pretty exciting. Yeah, that's kind of my educational journey so far. So did you have to do an internship type program for your leadership master's? I did. The funny thing about that, though, I had completed, I think it was a semester and then a quarter of the semester and then the world shut down. Oh, so yeah. everything changed. And I was, uh, I had just had my daughter, my, my second child right before then too. So I was like, oh, okay. Like I'll be on maternity leave. It'll be great. Just focus on grad school. And then everything changed. So the fortunate thing was I was home with my daughter, but I had virtual zoom school. So that was, that was different. Mm -hmm. I definitely felt for my students who had to take all their classes online. And here I am focusing on my master's degree with like one or two classes at a time. So that was, that was a whole challenge too. But yeah, then my internship had to be virtual too. So I kind of got a totally different experience than I was expecting. It worked out, but. Yeah, I can't even imagine what that would look like as far as trying to get that experience. But obviously through the pandemic, that's, that's what you have to do. Right. Chelsea, I want to talk more about your classroom. I got to know you on social media uh, through Teach Better 19 and heard about what you were doing with self-paced mastery learning. But in addition with that, the grid method and how you were using that in your classroom. So I'd love to know kind of your transformation as a teacher, specifically using that self-paced mastery learning. Absolutely. So I didn't realize I was that passionate about self-paced learning until I discovered the grid method. I'll be honest, at our school, we had dabbled in a couple of different like methods. Blended learning was a was big push that we were trying to do. And I knew my classroom always wanted to be set up that way. I just didn't know how to do it. Right. And plus, when you're a newer teacher, there's a lot of things you're bombarded with and you're trying to implement all the things. So um, I actually discovered Ray Hewitt on Instagram. Her classroom was like a dream. I'm so thankful that she shared everything she did on social media because I would just watch her stories and be like, that's what I want my classroom to be like. So I got in contact with her went through the trainings and then we actually were fortunate enough. I was like, um, I guess we can plug in, put the plug in. I know now they're going to be giving away professional development, free yes. professional development. So that's what I did. Like, I think it was, Oh gosh, was it three years ago now? I was like, I'll, I'll just, I'll try. I'll see if we'll get it. And Chad only lives, I think like maybe a half hour away from me. So he's really close to our school. And so I ended up winning the professional development and my principal was really excited already about like the grid method because I was the only one in our building that was using it. She's like, oh, that would be awesome. So I remember the day that I won and I told her, I like ran out of our office like a couple weeks before. I'm like, I just want to let you know, I, you know, applied for this giveaway, this professional development. I don't think I'll win, but I just want to let you know. She's like, okay, cool. And then she calls me one day and I'm like, was teaching, not in the, like the mindset that, you know, she was going to call me. And so she calls me and I was like, Yes. And she's like, you won. I was like, I won. I won what? 
<laughs> She's like, you won the professional development. So I was so excited. I was like, oh my gosh, Chad Ostrowski is coming to our school. And now I've met Chad several times uh, since then, but it was so exciting. So he came to our building. Everyone was really excited about it. And now I would say about like half of our staff has now implemented the grid method, which oh, wow. is amazing to me that I, I started doing this. And I'm like, this sounds cool. I'll mm-hmm. start this. I never thought other people would be like, this is really cool too. And then like, they did it as well. Her building has been fully trained on the grid method. Chad comes regularly now, which is amazing. And so he checks in on us and, you know, how we're doing provides us support. So that's kind of how I fell into teach better. Yeah. And the rest is history. <laughs> so Chelsea, for those who may not know what the grid method is, can you just kind of give like a quick summary of what that program has done within your classroom and for your students? Oh, absolutely. So the grid method is kind of like a self-paced mastery learning framework. And I know at my school, we already did mastery learning. Um, this was kind of the next step. And what I love about the grid method is it is completely transparent to the students They know exactly where they're going, where they've been. So it's set up for kind of like scaffold learning. So you have different levels. So level one is usually recall. You're learning new information. You're practicing it. And then at the end of a grid, usually um, there'll be like a quiz or some type of assessment, quick check. And if you master, you can level up to the next level. So level two is usually applying that information. And then three is strategic thinking. And then what I love the most about it, which I always struggled with, was my high achievers who are always just sitting there and waiting for, you know, the next, the next thing they, they finish early and then, you know, they don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. And what I loved about the grid method is they could learn all the information from the first three levels. And then I could provide them enrichment, which I never really had the format to do before. So that was, that was really fun. And that I probably my students have excelled academically academically a lot more now that I've implemented this practice. Yeah, I bet. So Chelsea, I can just imagine those who are listening, they're like, that sounds incredible as far as the self pace and for the students to be on their own as far as that goes academically. But how does a teacher assess that? So what is like your grading process with the grid method? Well, I realized and I being being a young kind of like naive teacher, not really knowing, like, you know, you only know what, you know, you've gone through. So I would do these giant tests because that's what I always did as a kid and not knowing that probably wasn't the best practice. And I would wait till the end of the unit to give a big assessment and then realize a lot of my students didn't get it. But I was like, oh man, we got to keep up with the pace. I don't know what to do. So, you know, you're just kind of like pushing them along. And that wasn't good for my students or for myself. (laughs) And um, I realized, you know, throughout the years, just I kind of went through and made made my grading more transparent. Mm -hmm. Once I met the, and I've never met her in person, but the wonderful Caitlin Giordano, (laughs) we've only met on Zoom, but uh, hopefully we'll meet her at Teach Better 2022. She graciously shares all of her resources. So she gave me her kind of like mastery grading rubric. And it just made sense because in my district, we still have that, you know, zero to 100 traditional grading scale, which you can only fit in the confines of the box that you're provided. And after, you know, also talking to Dave Schmidt, realizing that we have so many different ways to tell a student that they, they earned an F, like a zero to 59. And that's a huge jump. And once I realized that after implementing Caitlin's grading scale, which, you know, her starts, I believe it at six, six out of 10. Mm-hmm. So you're already jumping above that hurdle of, right. you know, the failure. So I've realized that a lot of my students, that was where they, they struggled because they could put in the work and truly not maybe understand the material yet. And they're really trying, but the grade wasn't truly reflecting what they were doing. Mm -hmm. So showing kind of, you know, aligning my grading scale more to standards-based grading, which I don't have the grade book that would actually show that yet. So trying to, you know, work with that. And um, I've, I've seen a lot of my students' grades, you know, truly reflect their learning. And that's been so much easier for me as a teacher. I was like, what did they really know? Cause I really couldn't a- answer that before. And so that has been, that has been quite the journey going through learning about all these different grading practices yeah. 
And I had a lot more questions than that answers. And that scared me last year because that was my whole master's project that I based it on. I was like, I don't, I don't know. I don't know anymore. <laughs> I thought I'd have all the answers, but I didn't. But um, that whole process, I learned a lot from that process though too. I'm still learning, mm -hmm. which has been pretty good. Yeah. Well, and that's that's important as any educator, right? You, you don't want to be stagnant. You want to continue to grow. So that includes grading practices too. I applaud you for that. Not just taking the zero to 100 <laughs> scale yeah. and just hoping that it reflects student mastery. This podcast is a proud member of the Teach Better Podcast Network. Better today, better tomorrow, and the podcast to get you there. You can find out more at teachbetter.com slash podcast. Now let's get back to the episode. So I want to dive into another piece that you kind of touched on, which was student choice. I know that, you know, you've been talking through providing problems to students. And I'm just curious on kind of within your lessons as you're building it, you know, how are you allowing your students to choose what direction they want to go within their learning? A lot of the times, and I think my students, they might not be used to this a lot of times. I asked them and I did this today too. I was like, I have two lessons planned. I was like, which one do you want to do today? So even like that too, where it's not just individualized choice, but like kind of giving them the opportunity to provide me feedback. And I love giving them surveys. I'm, I'm sure they're probably tired of all my surveys, but I'm like, how are we doing? How am I doing? What can I do better? I usually provide them a Google form. And I think the first time where I said, what can I do to be a better teacher? A lot of them didn't know how to answer that. They're like, is this a trap? Am I allowed to tell you? They're like, no, you're good. Like That's what they would type in a lot of times. And so I'd have to coach them through it and be like, no, 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 you really can tell me it's fine. And I think you know, throughout the year, once you provide, you establish that relationship with your students, they realize it's not a trap. You're really asking. And, you know, at our building, we have PBLs. So we do problem-based learning where we provide them a problem and they have to find out all these solutions. And what I love about this format is that it can go so many different ways. Obviously you can kind of steer, you gently steer them, not like hard steer them. I rarely have a student who's like totally <laughs> off track, but they have so many great ideas. I know the one PBL we're working on right now, we're working with Downtown Akron Partnership and our students recently, you know, went on a walking tour downtown and we were trying to get them to kind of think about like, what do you notice downtown? We've, you know, had spent all this money. We've done, had a lot of construction downtown. It's yeah. beautiful. We've done, redone main street. They've done a great job, but we can't bring people back downtown We there. We just don't have a lot, you know, it's not very populous during the day. So they're trying to think of ways to maybe bring people back downtown events, like whatever their solution is and providing them that choice and then bringing in back that community partner so they could present out to them. It's just, it, it's so cool like to get that experience from fifth grade to an eighth grader. And it's amazing to see the change in that, like when they're, you know, little fifth graders just out of like elementary and, you know, they're don't really haven't had that much experience with communication skills and, you know, presenting to somebody that's not their teacher. And then by eighth grade, they're just like, yep, I can do this. <laughs> no problem. Well, I like that too, because it's a problem that, is close to home, right? It's not just some mm -hmm. problem somewhere out in the world that they don't have connection with. It's something that's in their backyard. So I think that might give a little bit more value to them too as they're trying to find a solution. So I love that idea. That's amazing. Which kind of leads me to the next piece of student leadership because you know, you're talking about them finding a solution to a community problem. And I'm wondering what other ways you're enhancing their students in, in their leadership journey too. Yeah. So I know at our school, we have student ambassadors. Mm -hmm. And before the pandemic, we had a lot of visitors that would come to our building and tour and see like kind of like our format. So these student ambassadors would go around, show a tour of our building. I know before then, I would usually have my learners in my classroom, since we are self-paced, I would have learners who were probably working at a faster pace than most of their classmates. So then they became experts. And I would encourage them to help other learners. Uh, we, we usually did like the cup system. I didn't get to do it this year, which bums me out because those, those little cups made such a big difference. Just visually, they had four different, you know, colors and 
if they if they were struggling, it was like orange. And then another student could see that one student was struggling and they could come on over and help mm. them, especially since it's just one of me in a big class. And I remember uh, a couple of years ago, I probably like, I think it was 2020, right before everything shut down. And so I had a, uh, two teachers come in to observe my classroom and observe my students. And uh, they, one of the, they were near a group of students and uh, the one student was like, I don't understand this question. And then another boy came up and was like, oh no. And they were having this discussion about science, which excites me because science is hard sometimes, all the new vocabulary. And this learner had been struggling all year. And for him to sit down and be like, oh no, you got to think about it this way and like help this other student. I'm like, yes, this is what I strive for all the time. But I was like, I'm trying so hard to create that classroom environment where they're totally like comfortable doing that. I have this daily check-in form and I ask them all the time, like, how do you feel? And I've noticed this year, especially they're writing down things um, more so like, I feel calm. I feel relaxed. Mm -hmm. I feel comfortable. And I'm like, that's what I want. I want you to feel comfortable in this space together. Okay. I was going to talk about something else, but you spawned another question in my head because of the check-in piece, where did, where did that come from and what value are you finding with the daily check-ins? Well, I used to do daily check-ins hard copy, which okay. was really hard for me to monitor. So yeah. then my uh, genius coworker, Katie, came up with, it, it's so simple. It was a Google form, which I love Google forms. I just, I don't know why I didn't think about it sooner. So she had created one and I was like, this is, this is amazing. And so it was like, it would check in with where their progress was, setting their intentions for learning. So like, what are you working on today? Um, and then she would put, how do you feel? And so I had recently found out like mood meters, which you can go Google and they have a ton of them because I realized even in eighth grade, a lot of my eighth graders couldn't, they were like, I feel good. I feel bad. I feel angry. Like it was just very simple. So in the mood meter, it has like four, the one I found is like four different quadrants and they even do, I love everything by color. I color code everything. So if you're feeling calm, you're in the green section, you know, if you're feeling kind of, you know, sad, even bored is in the blue section. Mm -hmm. And if like, they're really like happy and energized, it's like green. And not only like they, they tell me what the color is so I can conditional format so I can like visually see how they're feeling, but then they have to tell me like, okay, what do you, how do you feel? And I notice as the year goes on, they're using words that they normally wouldn't have, you know, used at the beginning of the year, like. I feel energized. Like I, no, no eighth grader tells me that in conversation. How do you feel today? Energized. Like <laughs> you should say just good, you know? Right. So they're kind of pulling out more of that vocabulary. So that SEL piece, I love that I can scroll through that Google sheet it generates and it color codes it. So some days, and I always see this, my second period, they're a little more in the blues, but it's more because they're tired. Yeah. <laughs> That's usually what it says. And then they, as the day goes on, so we can see like those, you know, ebbs and flows of their mood. And that's been really interesting to track. Well, you talked about ambassadors in the classroom. I know you are also an ambassador with the Teach Better team. So will you just kind of describe that program for those who may not know what a Teach Better ambassador is? Yes. So if you love Teach Better, <laughs> as you should, I was so excited to be a Teach Better ambassador. So Megan and Andrea lead our amazing ambassador team, and they opened up applications. So I applied, and it was a super simple application. And um, once I was selected, they have monthly hangouts, which are pretty fun. And it's just so nice to be a part of a group of like just educators who are just passionate about education and like all things kind of like pushing innovative ideas in education. And then we have a Boxer group, which if you don't know Boxer, it's a kind of like it's audio messaging, but we text a lot in it because everyone loves gifts. So it's just like sending gifts back and forth a lot of times too. But it's so it you know it it's nice to be a part of a group where you don't feel alone like especially last year mm -hmm. and I became an ambassador I think it was in March of last year and last year was hard I was virtual most of the school year and if anyone knows me as a teacher 
I need to be in person with my students, especially science. Teaching science through a computer screen was so difficult for me. And I thrive off of student relationships and talking with students. And I, I told my, my students that the other day, I was like, I am so thankful to be in person with you because it's so nice to be able to like get to know you. And I get it. Like, I'm sure if I was a middle schooler and it had to be virtual, it would have been tough it, to, to be that person to unmute and speak out. And, and I realized like, I just felt, you know, really lonely last year, mm -hmm. but with that team, I wasn't the only one that felt that way. And that, that felt so much better to me. I was like, okay, I'm not the only one that's experiencing this. I, cause I felt like we were the last district to go back in person, at least in my area, it felt that way. And it was nice to see, cause I mean, teacher ambassadors are from all over in different countries and just mm -hmm. to hear their experiences and what they're going through and sharing. And especially this year, like we thought last year was hard and like this year presents a whole new list of challenges. Mm -hmm. And so it's just so nice. And not, I mean, we don't always share challenges. We, I love when people are like, hey, this awesome thing happened to me today or something simple. Or like the other day, I think Adam shared, hey, we got our first snowfall. And that was nice to see. Like, just, just, I don't know. I just love how supportive the whole group is. Yeah, I love that group. The ambassador, you know, hangouts too are so much fun. And I agree, the the Boxer group, I, I was reflecting on that the other day when I was using Boxer is just how much I leaned on that in different communities last year just to, to make those connections. Um, because yeah, it, it's, it can be lonely in leadership. It can be lonely as an educator a lot of times. I and mean, it's good to have a community that you can connect with and, and share different stories, different struggles, different celebrations. So I couldn't agree with you more, Chelsea. I, I, I think the Teach Better Ambassador Group is just made up of some phenomenal folks. So happy you're a part of that. I'm going to ask you something that I always ask my guests because I think it's really important to get some actionable items for my listeners. So if you were to give a piece of advice or maybe a tip or trick and they want to enhance their leadership journey, what might they do tomorrow or next week? Me personally, I never really considered myself a leader until like other people started giving me chances and I realized I shouldn't just wait. So if I had an idea and I wanted to do it, I love teaching so much. I'm, I'm that kind of person who I love teaching professional development. So I just started asking my principal, can I do this? And she would be like, yeah, I don't think she's ever told me, no, you can't do that as professional development. And so I think if you have an idea, just start sharing it whether it's you know, social media, social media, I, I love social media for the good that it is. I mean, it's, it's sometimes I just think no one's going to want to know how my science lesson went for the day. And sometimes I'll just share how it went. And people are like, oh my gosh, this is awesome. Thank you so much for sharing this resource. And I, that's amazing. Like I was like, oh, cool. Any way to help anybody, whether it's in my building or if it's somebody who's, you know, across the country, using a lesson that I shared, I think that's awesome. So I would say just kind of get out there, share. I know sometimes we think no one's going to want to hear or, well, you know, what we have to share, but I think we all have valid ideas. I think just kind of putting yourself out there, whether it's with your principal or online, um, that would be a great way to kind of step forward in leadership. Yeah. So Chelsea, you talked about social media and connecting with other people and sharing different ideas. I know that you're on Instagram quite a bit sharing ideas. Yes. <laughs> For those who want to learn more from you and what you're doing, you know, all the phenomenal things that you're doing in your classroom, how might they connect with you on social media? Sure. So I'm primarily on um, Instagram. So that's at just a teacher from Akron, all lowercase one word. And then I'm also on Twitter at Chelsea Nicolino. And then I'm also on Facebook, you can find me there. I'll post pictures of my kids and probably most better teach better stuff a lot of times too. Yeah. And it's just my name, Chelsea Nicolino. Awesome. Well, definitely connect with Chelsea. You got to find her on social media because she does put out just a lot of amazing content, um, things that you can use within the classroom in your schools. Check out all the amazing things that she's doing and then also um, check out things that she's doing with the Teach Better team because she is an amazing ambassador. Chelsea, it was phenomenal to meet you in person and I can't wait for Teach Better 22 to see you again and I really really appreciate your time tonight and just you know sharing your experiences and what you're doing to enhance student achievement in your classroom. Thank you so much Josh. Thanks for having me.